Welcome to The Big Interview. I'm Alan Murray, and I'm here with Mark Cuban, a successful entrepreneur, owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, uh, NBA champion Dallas Mavericks. I, I'm sorry. To, for, <laughs> we were hoping you would bring the trophy and set it on the table here. Next time. Uh, also a reality TV star, uh, also a hyperactive blogger. Uh, I don't know which of those. I mean, how do you describe yourself? Oh, uh, just an entrepreneur. You an know, entrepreneur. Yep. Well, so so then as an entrepreneur, let me talk to you a little bit about what the news we've been living with sure. for the last couple of weeks because the markets have been going through these wild gyrations. Right. Um, don't seem to have a clear sense of what direction is up. Uh, how do you interpret that as somebody who's spent a lot of time playing well, the market? Well, put on my, you know, manage the portfolio trader hat, um, and not so much a trader, but manage the portfolio. It's great, you know. Um, anytime there's volatility and any type time there's change there's opportunity now I say it's great because I've taken a whole different approach to investing than most people you know I think buy and holds a crock of shit. I think you know the idea that you always have to invest your your cash is not far behind and so I've always been of the attitude that um, unless you really have a, a commitment to something just keep your money in cash knowing that at some point in time there are, there's going to be a week or two like we've had. But how much time, I mean, you've got a lot going on in your life. How much time do you have to actively manage your portfolio through these 500-point market swings? Well, see, that's the down? whole thing. I don't have to spend much time until, until it hits the fan, right? So I don't, I mean, I did. a lot of hitting the fan this well, week. Well, that's exactly right, <laughs> and that's where the opportunity is. Like, I wouldn't look at my portfolio or, you know, I get, I get a, you know, a, a one-line, um, one-number statement every day from um, my bank, and, you know, that tells me if anything weird happened, and I wouldn't even look at it, but then when everything starts getting crazy, I call it the World Series of Investing, you know, that's when you start digging in, and it's because of the approach that I take. So, you know, back in 2006 and 2007, I was writing blogs saying, look, the stock market's for suckers, you're getting put, you know, when you sit down at the business table, you always look for the sucker, and if you don't see it it's you and you've got all these professional people on the other side of the trades I mean when I started trading stocks in the early 90s after I sold my first company you know you could understand different elements of the market better than the professionals so I can understand you know new technology from Wellfleet and Synoptics and all these old technology companies better than the traders today there's so much money in these huge hedge funds and it then they have such professional research and in-depth research there really aren't any advantages for the individual traders and so my approach has always been unless I know something specific put it in cash and so and so what are you investing in what are the areas that well, you what I did, feel you know what I did when I in 2008 and 2009 I put everything into MLPs and MREITs the, um, um, mortgage backed securities ones that I thought were the better companies um, and I just piled in and I also piled into Australian bonds because I thought the economy was good next to China It was my way of playing China so you and, make one-way bets this isn't portfolio balancing you're no, talking about yeah, all that asset management you know diversification that's for idiots right because you because you can't you can't diversify enough to know what you're doing right I mean I did my homework on Australia right I did my homework on the Emery's I did my homework on MLPs and their pricing had just gotten crushed. And, and so what are you doing right now so what I'm what I did right now I'd, I'd been going all the dividends and everything I'd be I put just put into cash and so I don't think stocks have fallen enough to just dot to say these particular any particular stocks are cheap right so when I looked at the MLPs in 2008 and 9 they were paying 18 19 percent for companies that had never missed a, a payment right it always put out all their cash and they look dirt cheap now you know you look at good companies Apple hasn't fallen that much and just to be down 10 15 percent from their highs they're still not as low as they were 18 months ago and so what I did was I said self self there's gonna be a lot of volatility so I bought um, put took a little bit of money and bought out of the money calls on the uh, on the um, spider calls I bought on the S um, standards and pours the SP 500 and then I did the same thing on the diamonds which is the Dow Jones so I bought those long when I when the stock prices cratered and then when we had the big not today but the big run up before I bought a bunch of puts knowing that even though I was paying for a lot of vol volatility that I thought there would be a lot of swings in the market and so I so just, you're just betting on volatility I'm just betting on and volatility. how long is that gonna last in your view 
No idea. And that's the whole thing, right? People aren't buying intrinsic value in companies anymore. The whole Warren Buffett approach works great for Warren because he can put a $3 billion into an investment and take a whole different approach than John or Sally Doe investor who can't do yeah, that. Yeah, but so what? So you say buy and hold is a crock of something. Right. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, Shinola. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you said that portfolio balancing is a waste of time. So what are John and Sally Doe supposed to do? Depends how much money you have. Right. So the best way to get a return, let's just say you have fifty thousand dollars in cash. It could be ten, it could be a hundred. But you know, let's use fifty. The first thing I would do is pay off all your credit cards, because that's costing you eighteen percent. That's what John and Sally should do first. Most don't, right? There's more credit card and student loan debt um, relative to personal income than there's ever been in the history of the United States. Second thing you do is you use the transactional value of cash. A lot of people say, you know, you're losing money to inflation when you just have cash in the bank. I completely disagree. I can, you know, I know I'm gonna be buying a bunch of toothpaste for my family. I know toilet paper. I know all the consumables that I have. I can take my cash and go get a better value. I can take my cash and what go do you buy store service. up? Yeah. Yeah, why not? I mean, how much space does toothpaste take, you know, but you're going to spend. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. The time it takes just to figure out your budget, yeah. which nobody does. The time yeah. it takes just to analyze your spending habits, you can get a better return and you'll end up with more cash than trying to fight the, the John Paulsons of the world and these guys who, who have hundreds of analysts who are working for them. Why would you try to do better than them? You, you can't, can't win. You can't. And now it's a it's hundred times worse because of all the, the program trading. But if you have enough money that you have to put some of it somewhere to park some of it somewhere and hope to make a return on it, where do you put it? You know, what I do, I don't I don't think you have to make a return on it because I'd rather sleep well at night. You know, I put it in cash, literally. Now, obviously, I'm in a different position where I'm, I don't have to live off of the interest paying me one basis point off of right. cash. Right. But at the same time, the having that dry powder, if you will, available when weeks like today or weeks like this week hit and days like yesterday and today. And happen, you see an opportunity. And you see an opportunity, then you're ready to take it as yeah. opposed to saying, I can't get out. What am I going to do? And I'll tell you the other part that's better. You're going to cut your health costs because you're going to sleep a whole lot better at <laughs> do night. Do you sleep well? Oh, I sleep like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but did you sleep like a baby before the championship? No, or is that only no I gained about 15 pounds. <laughs> and it, um, yeah, it was brutal. Well, you've been, I've been reading your blog. You've been writing a lot lately about what it's going to take to get the U.S. economy back on right. track. What, can you share your ideas? Well, you know, my next blog, I think, is going to be about the law of big numbers. Right. We have a challenge in the United States where we don't have anybody in, in government who can think big enough to impact trillions of anything. Right. Historically, we're used to, you know, 100 million here, 100 million there. Pretty soon it all heads up and has an impact. But when you're dealing with 10 and 14 trillion dollar deficits, there's nothing they can come up with that's really going to have an impact. But you have to look at the blocking and tackling anyways. You know, I wrote a blog saying that we need to get rid, rid of um, business method process patents and right. software patents. You're the, worried about patent trolls. And well, the, the patent trolls are killing like... business. In my own business, you know, there's always one coming up for ridiculous things that you still, that the patent office granted a patent and you can challenge it and you can fight it but it's very expensive. But do you really think that's a that is huge. a big effect on job creation? Huge. huge. And I'll tell you why. Because for any particularly technology businesses or in any industrial technology business now there, there's unlimited uncertainty. You always hear people talking about the government, about the uncertainty of what's going to change, right? Well with patent laws right now there's so much litigation now that all my companies are getting hit, not once every six years, once or twice a year. And you don't want know where it's coming from, and you don't know when it's going to happen, and you don't know how much it's going to cost you to defend, and you don't even know if you're going to end up taking a big hit. So it makes you more cautious. You have to be far more cautious, and you're paying more in insurance, increasing insurance rates than even health care costs. But, but you also, I, I think that's an interesting proposal. You wrote another column that, uh, uh, with a, a, a proposal that was much further out there where you were suggesting that the government actually invest invest money right. in companies that will create jobs right now you know when we talk about um, positioning or approach to creating jobs um, we look at tax policy right and the the conventional wisdom says that from the Democratic side they said if you spend a lot the old Keynesian thing if you spend a lot you know you can create jobs the problem there or if and you can hire people 
infrastructure, whatever. The problem is the government's very in inefficient at implementing that. So even though, you know, for every dollar you're trying to create jobs with, you're only 70 cents, 75 cents is actually going to the infrastructure and less than that's going to the job, right? And then you don't even know if jobs are actually being created. On the Republican side, they say just cut taxes, that money will go into what end up creating jobs, when in reality, cash is not an inhibitor for most companies and there's nothing that's historically that says that if you cut taxes more jobs will be created at least not with direct correlations right what i said was look rather than hoping something happens let's play you know let's ask for volunteers you know basically saying if you have a company and not a startup but a company that's been in business 10 years has you know i picked an arbitrary number 100 million in sales so you're a, a definable easy to do due diligence on company Tell us if you need money to create jobs, and we'll let you kind of bid in a Groupon type way on basically saying, you know what, for X amount of dollars, I can create X number of jobs. And then we'll just work our way down the bids. So if Alan's company comes in and says, you know what, for $12 million, I can create 100 jobs. But do, you, but do you really think the government can pull that off? Well, I don't think the government itself. I think somebody outside of government, that's why I went on to say it's going to take a committee of nonpartisan people that have no, you know, it's going to be difficult to do, but it, because it's a completely different approach, you can take it outside the government, I think, and have it government funded from there. And the reason I said you, you can still do have the government essentially picking winners. Well, well yes. It's, in some it's venture capital. I mean, well, in, in some respects, it is venture capital, but compare it to what we're doing right now. Right now, it's just scattershot and praying, right? We change tax policy. Two, part, two sides don't even agree what tax policy should be, and we just pray. Right? We hope something happens. What I'm saying is, if you have an existing company and you're here to say that you're capital constrained and with capital you can create jobs, tell us about it, right? And we'll be able to do it. It, it accomplishes. What, the what same was thing. the response you got when you wrote that? Uh, uh Pretty far out there. Run for proposal. president. Run for president. Run for president. You thinking of that? No. And then on the other <laughs> side was it's our it's the government. It'll never happen. But, but every, would you ever run for office? Oh I mean, hell no. Are you but kidding there's me? But there's a there is a there does seem to be a leadership gap at the moment. No question. No question. <laughs> um, but I could hear the questions I'm now. You. Did you ever? Yes, <laughs> about a dozen times, and I liked it. So um, <laughs> it just. Let, uh, let, let's turn to sports, uh -huh. basketball. Uh, uh, I know you love your trophy. It's yes, got to pain you. The lockout has to pain you. You know, I, I can't even go there at all. I can't. Well, uh, why is that? I just because just the better commissioner not, commissioner told just, you to talk about. Not no, to talk about it's just better not to comment on because it. Because you are famous for talking about things you shouldn't be talking about. I know. Pick something else. I get really really <laughs> off the, off the well, wall. What topic? <laughs> what topic that you shouldn't be talking about? I'm talking about politics. Talking about. Like next to sports, right? <laughs> politics is even worse, right? But 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 let me ask you. Uh, 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 the lockout aside, uh, uh, did you do you own the Mavericks? As a business investment, I mean, do you actually make money? Off I can't of the go there. I can't go there. I wish you I can't could. go there at all. No. But do you? I mean, have you made money over the time you've all. owned it? I can't go there at all, Alan. Do you do sports as an investment? I didn't inhale, and um, I, <laughs> I thought you said I was, it was you did inhale. inhale. It was during college. Um, <laughs> you, you're not going to talk about I can't, basketball I can't at all. Basketball at all? Not at all. I wish I could. Uh, uh, how about baseball? You've been playing around in that area. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for baseball, it's got to be the right deal. I mean, basketball was something where I, I just have been a basketball junkie my entire life. So baseball, you did it for love of the sport? Yes. And, and for baseball, you would do it baseball, if, it, I love, if it's an I, investment? I like baseball. I mean, I was a better baseball player than basketball player in, in school. But at the same time, um, you know, to buy a franchise in a major market has gotten so expensive it has to be the right business deal. I think what we're finding out in other sports, like the Cubs, you know, I think the, the folks who bought it are great people. They're going to they're gonna do their best, but they spent so much money on the franchise, they have nothing left to invest in it, and you've got to yeah. be careful of that. Yeah. Do you think that opportunity is going to come? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And I'll look at whatever comes along, I'm happy to look at. You've spent some time looking at college sports as well. Yeah, nothing's really coming. We're still working. I've got some people working on it. Um, hopefully, we're, we're looking to have something to present um, in the middle of September. So I've got people working full time on that. So you made your your uh, first billion, your first billions, I guess, uh, in the last bubble. Right. 1998, you right. sold your company? No, I sold it in 2000, actually. You sold it in 2000, so yeah. right at the peak of the bubble. So you have to be congratulated on your timing. Uh, but it also has to give you some sense of how bubbles work. Sure. You see anything like that going on in technology right now? Mm, well, bubbles, 
you can look at bubbles two ways, right? Bubbles as they, they impact the, the general population. You know, back in the tech bubble, in the internet bubble, you'd get into a cab and they're talking about internet stocks, you know, and about stocks that just went up 30 points in the day and how they made all this money. Um, you don't do, that's not happening now. What's happening with, with tech stocks up until this past week anyways, is that VCs were getting into big names because it looked good in their portfolio. <laughs> And rather than individuals benefiting or getting hurt, it's the VCs that are playing their own game of bubble yes or bubble no. And mm -hmm. what's happening now is, you know, if you're an original investor in um, Twitter, that was great because the next VC who came in paid a higher valuation, gave some money to the company, but gave most of it to the first investors, yeah. right, or to management. Yeah. It didn't actually go into the company. Then the next level who came in, they gave some to the previous. It's almost like, it's more like a Ponzi scheme. It's, it's almost like an old chain letter. You know, the old but chain letter. That was true somewhat in 98, 99, 2000, Well, but the, the difference is you weren't, you weren't just cashing out a few folks um, you know, you were giving money to the, you were going into a public stock market that's readily exchanged, right? Yeah. So you're buying stock in broadcast.com and you're buying from somebody on a regular market. Whereas with, a, with today's technology VC bubble, you're going to this company, you're, and I'm, I'm not trying to pick on Twitter, whether it's Facebook, whoever, right? And you're saying, and they're saying, okay, our valuation just went up $2 billion and you're going to give us $500 million. Half of it's going to go to the, the VCs that got in before you so they yeah. can cash out. And half of it's going to go, and a quarter of it's going to go to management and a quarter of it will go to the company. And so it, you're laddering your way in and the new money's paying off the old money. Yeah. And you, but there's no outside stockholders that are really participating. Yeah. So where do you think the big entrepreneurial activities are right now? You know, in technology, the entrepreneurial activities are huge because the co opportunity, the, the chance for oppor opp entrepreneurial opp opportunities are there because the cost of technology has dropped so significantly. You know, you can, all you need is a laptop or a PC and an internet connection. You can pretty much do anything and create any type of company. The problem, as I mentioned earlier, is everybody's getting sued into oblivion. You know, companies large and small, you know, well, some, the little guy with the PC doesn't have to worry too much oh, about Oh, yeah, they trust me. Yeah. I mean, the minute they get on the radar, the minute they get any level of success, somebody's going to come and try to cut out their knees huh. because they're going to say, oh, I, I, you know, I won't mention names, but there, we got sued in one of the businesses because they said that their software did scene detection exactly the same way that our product did. Now, we had no idea. We weren't using their technology, right? They're just saying that software that they had created had did scene detection the same way we're doing it now. So but we're violating their patent. At some point, patents are important for innovation, right? No. You, no. I mean, what, you blow up the whole patent system? Yeah, absolutely You positive. don't need it? Don't need it. It wasn't necessary for broadcast.com? No. I mean, look, if, if patent litigation, we, I mean, I remember sitting down to fill out two patents, one for using IP addresses to discover um, location, and the other one was for distribution of video in a network, and thinking, what am I going to, what's the point? It's just it costing me money. It doesn't matter, right? You know, if you, you do it by getting there first and running, you a do it company. by winning in your business, by executing your business plan. Ideas are easy. I mean, if, if patent litigation was at the same level today or in the eighties as it was today, I mean, if you know the history of Microsoft, you know, they were competing with um, an operating system called CPM by a company called Digital Research. Digital Research would have gotten patents and all their stuff, and there'd be no Microsoft. Michael Dell used to just so knock off So what's changed? PCs. I mean, the laws haven't changed that The much. litigation culture has changed. The culture is so completely different. Too many people making money off of That's the whole patents. business. That, that, there's jurisdiction in East Texas. That's all they do. You know, and so everybody and their brother is buying up patents that were worthless in the first place and then using them as leverage. It's gotten so bad now, Alan, that companies are buying patent um, troves or collections to act as nuclear deterrents to other big companies with their own patent collections. <clears throat> so, you know, someone, someone just paid $4.5 billion for a patent of collections just so in the event that Mutually Apple... Mutually assured destruction. You come after us, we come we'll after come you. after you, and so nothing happens because that's the way you don't get sued because, the, the, you know, this company knows that the other company is violating one of their patents somewhere, and so they'll return the favor. That's ridiculous. That's $4.5 billion that could be used for almost anything else. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that Larry O'Brien trophy. You, you're spending a fair amount of time with that thing, aren't you? Yeah, we're in love. Um, my wife doesn't <laughs> what, like it, but do you, can you drink out of it? Do you swim with it? Do you? Uh... <laughs> Is this a family show? <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I've, 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 right after we won, I took it everywhere. Um, 
with me personally, slept with it, took it to the bathroom. <laughs> I wasn't letting go of that thing. Right now, um, it's literally sitting in my kitchen so that um, on the counter so that when I wake up in the morning to go you know, get breakfast, give it a little kiss. A little rub, <laughs> but but, you but think, I, will that wear off in time? Or uh? I hope not. I really, really hope not. But you know, the other thing that's fun with it is to take it to various places. I went and played basketball at my gym yesterday, and I've been promising the guys I play with that I bring the trophy. And so I took it to Lifetime Fitness in Dallas, and um, I was just going to show it to the basketball guys, and because you know you forget the impact and and how important it was to the city of Dallas and in North Texas. Every the whole gym just stopped. <laughs> Everybody just stopped, and they all came in and started taking turns, you know, to take their picture. You and to touch it? Oh, they... touch it. I let them do whatever they wanted. I, I didn't want to know that, that he was cheating on me. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it teaches you a lot about sports that um, as much as I think I own the Mavs, I don't. You know, it's it's North Texas that owns the Mavericks and, and Mavs fans around the world. And, you know, winning the championship was not only emotionally, you know, draining and fulfilling for me, but I mean, it really picked up the spirits of, 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 all, of all of North Texas. I mean, it, the, the most amazing thing is that people don't come up to me and say congratulations in Dallas. They come up to me and say thank you. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Well, congratulations, thank Mark you. Cuban. Thanks for being with us thank on you, the Alan. big interview.